Hi friends, it's Monica and let's watch Shadow and Bone Season 1 Episode 7. So we're almost at the end of Season 1 and I hope you've been enjoying my little reaction series that I have made so far. If you have not yet watched my other reactions to the other episodes, they will be linked in the description box below. And let's just get right into this episode. With training, with an amplifier, I could see another hundred years, maybe more. That seems a long time to you, I'm sure. Right from the beginning of episode 7, we are given a background story of the Darkling that we never really got in the books. And the first thing I thought when I saw with the Darkling's character was his hair because in the first shot when they're outside, it, his hair looks weird but, <laughs> but his hair looks better when it's like proper lighting. <laughs> so people are obviously still after the Darkling and he obviously cares for this Grisha here and she's wanting to live with him for a longer lifetime than she has. Please, no, I'm begging you, please! And I do like how we get more of a motivator behind the Darkling's actions and how complex the Darkling himself is. And he's not just a cut and dry evil villain that we sometimes get. When losing someone like the Darkling does here, it does show that he had some human emotions before. They're punishing us for being Grisha. Punishing you? You made him afraid. And I think over here it's interesting to see Bagra point out directly towards Alexander, who is the cause of the king sending his soldiers after the Grisha and the Darklings like, no, that's not it. I wanted to save us. I wanted to give us more rights and freedoms, but it has led to them hunting them down. We need to safeguard all Grisha. We need to teach them how to fight. Most Grisha aren't fighters. They fix things, they make things. Then the Darkling decides to make an army and Grisha, they cannot do full-on magic as Bad Grab mentions here, so she's concerned for her son. Here, this is where the Darkling makes himself like a human amplifier or a natural amplifier, dipping into magic that would obviously have some consequences. I have no army to fight yours. So I shall remake yours as my own. See, I think what the Darkling was imagining was having the king's soldiers be part of his own personal army that he has complete control over, but then obviously that does not happen because that's a lot of power and Grisha aren't meant to be using magic is what I'm understanding. And then here we see the creation of the fold what did you do? He created the fold. I think that does show like how the Darkling grows with whatever happens. He's like, okay, I'm just gonna use this as a weapon now because it's already done and made, so might as well go along with it. But the crows here, Kaz made the decision to return back to Ketterdam and it's still nice to see the dynamic between the crows still changing and evolving. You make this a lot harder, you know. The funny thing about this scene is just Inej is stitching herself up and then Jesper is just cracking jokes. <laughs> I love it. So with Alina and the stag, Alina thinks that there should be another way of not needing to kill the stag. She feels a certain bond with the animal, but the Darkling of course comes, takes that away. And then here's her arrival of the Darkling. When the Darkling arrives and Alina realizes that she either has to choose between saving Mal or saving the stag and she still chooses Mal, it just continues to show how strong of their friendship is. He was only protecting Miss Darkoff. And I think when the Darkling says, I'm a man of my word, like I still follow through of whatever I have said previously, even though with him saying certain things, like he words things really precisely. I think that's just like a little interesting thing about his character. So you are leaving? That's it. After everything, there's nothing else you want to say to me. I do like how Inej is asking, like, what do you believe in? What do you have in your life that keeps you going? 
Because for Inej, that's her faith, right? But then with Kaz, it's a complex puzzle for Inej to figure out. And with Kaz on his side, he doesn't really lean so much on faith, but he leans into what he knows and trusts in the people around him, which are the crows. I do love these little scenes between Kaz and Inej that we do get in their little prequel story. Oh, I know things. General Kerrigan, is it? Or is Alexander a fake name too? Careful with your words, Helena. And there's a little emphasis again of be careful of your words, of what you say to me because whatever you dictate or try to provoke the Darkling, something bad of your certain choice of words or even actions will come as a result of that. Um, considering the flashback story of the Darkling in the beginning of this episode, it does bring up the question of trying to find someone to be a partner with him because he does have a sense of loneliness even though he does have all that power. It can be lonely at the top, so he's trying to get her to be on his side, but the way he goes about it is wrong for Alina, of course. When the amplifier is being molded into Alina, ugh, it's disgusting to look at. <laughs> it's a little bit more gruesome and same with the Darkling. The thing on his hand. Not to gang up on you, but Jess has a point. Jess. It's Suli for friendship. No, it's not. And the crows here, they're trying to like see if they could get back across the vault, back to Katadam. I just really like the little banter scene here with it's just really nice to see their friendship even after they have their disagreements. In this scene, Jenya is trying to show Lena her perspective of things in the Little Palace and how she has grown up and why she has been loyal to General Kirigan. Of course, Alina is not going to take that so kindly. I love how the writers just added in more Darkling and Mal scenes because having these two characters on screen together is so nice to watch and we have the darkling saying again i am a man of my word with his word like it doesn't really mean much to mal nor alina for that matter and i think the darkling is flexing on mal of his powerfulness and his power that he holds over everyone and we have like a reappearance of Milo here with the bullet that Jesper tied around his neck. And it does come into play here with Mal to escape. Angry old woman. And who should I believe? You've been lying to me since the day I met you. Telling you half a story is not the same as lying. In The Darkling, in this particular scene, he's making a last appeal to Alina. And Alina does mention that they could have been good for each other as long as he done it in such a way that they were equal partners, like an actual partnership. But then the Darkling took matters into his own hands and made her a prisoner. Okay. You put this collar on me to exploit my power for your game. Us. To help us conquer the foe together. And uh, again, like the Darkling tries so hard to achieve his goal of making the Grisha safer but the way he's going about it is not the best way but then again he's centuries old and he will do anything to achieve that final goal of his and to maintain the power that he has fine make me your villain i doubt very much they'll notice your feet and like the Darkling literally has Alina chained to the ship's deck but then like the actual symbolism of Alina earlier in the season asking if she was a prisoner in the little palace and now she's an actual prisoner under control of the Darkling so that bit of foreshadowing did play out. No one's dying today. No mourners. No funerals. And another known line from the Six of Crows duology, no mourners, no funerals. And that's the end of episode seven. So this episode, we do learn more about the Darkling's character and we get more in depth with his character. And I really appreciate that we do see more of 
his backstory of which we never really got to see in the books and it's really interesting to see how it does show the multiple layers of the Darkling and how he's just not one-dimensional. He had a past lover who got killed by the king's soldiers and that's how he created the fold. But the ultimate goal in mind is to save Grisha and give Grisha more of a voice in Ravka but then a result of his actions it came about to be the fold and him being ageless and now he's attempting to do that again to find a partner in Alina. He could have maintained his power but Ravka is still at war with the Fjordans and also the Shu Han. And like in an earlier episode there was also some word with the West Ravkins wanting to be independent and that's where we got the assassination attempt on Alina. So we do have everything kind of coming together and giving us a more full view of what the big picture is for the Darkling. On the other side of things, we have Alina, who is now being trapped by the Darkling and having that weird antler thing sticking out of her. Ugh. <laughs> With Alina, she's, she's seeing herself as a captive and that's more or less all there is to it because she is one under the Darkling now. And it goes to show how Alina did mention that we could have been something more to the Darkling, but with the actions of the Darkling, killing the stag and like taking control of her, injuring Mal, all of those things are like unforgivable in Alina's eyes. And then we have Mal who is of course still all determined to save Alina and he does his best, but when you're going against people with Grisha powers, it's kind of difficult for him to do that. So he does manage to find his way onto the ship and then we have the crows as well discussing we're going back to Ketterdam and how are we going to go back to Ketterdam and they also find themselves on the ship across the fold with Alina and the Darkling. I think that is going to be it for this video. I cannot wait to see the finale again and see how season one concludes. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to give me a big thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below, and ring that notification bell to not miss any future uploads. I'll see y'all soon.